je suis très content de vous revoir. Ça m'est fait très heureux. Mais quand même, euh, je vais vous adresser aujourd'hui sur le topic de Cloud Native Java. Et à vrai dire, le, le français, ce n'est pas ma, 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 c'est pas ma langue maternelle. Alors, je vais m'exprimer en anglais, OK? C'est pas si grave? Bon. <laughs> Allez, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today, my friends. We're going to go through a lot of stuff, so much stuff. And thankfully, we have one hour. But that said, I don't want you to try and remember everything that we will talk about. That's not the goal. What I want you to appreciate is what is possible. So there is a Git repository, a repository there that you can use to follow along later on, okay? So copy that, that link, that repository there for your own reference. Uh, I'm on Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? Twitter? Okay, very good. What about the... Wow, that's... It's good, but the rest of you, you should get on Twitter. Twitter's awesome. It's the new IRC. If you have questions, if you want to engage with the community, you can find us there. We're happy to talk, happy to answer questions. What about email? Email. 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 Anybody? Anybody? No. Okay, well, if you're there as well, I'm happy to engage as well. It's not as friendly. It doesn't, you can't share what we do in email as easily, right? So I prefer Twitter, but I'll engage however you want, right? And a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Josh Long. I'm a Spring developer advocate on the Spring team. I'm an open source contributor uh, and engineer. I have worked on the Spring team for now more than eight years uh, in some capacity or another. Uh, I am the number one, number one, top ranked, most visible, most highly recognized, most prolific, most famous contributor of, uh, you know, bugs. But still, still, number one, number one, more bugs per commit than any other developer on the Spring team. That, yeah, exactly. Now, to, to be clear, I, I, I just want to be clear, I didn't fix the bugs. I, I may have created them, you know. But it's still number one, number one. So there's that. And I, and I also, I'm a Java champion, and that works, you know, that's very much what I do in my day job as a Spring developer advocate. I spend my time trying to help organizations, customers, community members, etc., build better software. And as part of that, I do training videos. I, did, I just finished the, the second edition of that training video, uh, Building Microservices with Spring Boot Live Lessons, uh, with my friend, the one, the only, the amazing Phil Webb. He's the co-founder of Spring Boot. And I just finished my fifth book, called Cloud Native Java. And that book is all about how to build applications that survive and thrive in the cloud. Right? It's, applica- it's how to build applications with Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry. And for those of you wondering, and I can see this in your eyes, I can see in your eyes, you're wondering, what is that bird? What is the animal on that cover? That bird... You know, it's very important. When you, whenever you buy an O'Reilly book, the O'Reilly books are famous for the animals. Nobody buys them for the stuff inside. It's all about the animal, right? If you have a bad animal, nobody's going to buy it. So I worked very hard on the animal. The animal we have is a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird that is indigenous to the Indonesian Java Islands. It's a bird that is indigenous to the Java Islands. In English, we could also say that that bird is native to the Java Islands. So it's a bird that is native to Java. And now birds, birds fly. Often through the clouds. So it's a bird that flies through the clouds that is native to Java. It's a cloud native Java bird. It's a bird that's native to Java that flies through the cloud. Never mind. G- give it time. It'll come. Stop having you. So there's that. And I work at Pivotal. And at Pivotal, we have a lot of great open source software. You may recognize some of the software on this slide. We've got uh, Spring, of course, and Spring's kind of a thing. We've got Cloud Foundry. Uh, we've got Apache Tomcat. Uh, we've got Redis, RabbitMQ, uh, lots of different, oh yeah, lots of different great open source software uh, that we have. Uh, at, at Pivotal, and we care very much about open source. But let's be very clear here. Let's be very, very clear. At the end of the day, the thing that we care about the most, more than anything else, is helping customers and community members and organizations build software better and faster and safer. We want to help them deliver value to the customer. 
And we see that a lot of organizations struggle with this. They know that they need to go faster. They know that they need to capture that agility. But they struggle with how to do it because a lot of these organizations are lucky enough to have been around for more than a few years. They are lucky enough, lucky enough to have you know, some time in their history. So they look for ways to go faster, but they have these large existing monolithic applications. These monolithic applications are very hostile to change. It requires a lot of people to make any change. So they look for ways to go faster. They understand that if they can reduce the size of work, if they can reduce the scope of work, then the cost of releasing new software is cheaper. Right? So they look for ways to take their large existing monolithic application and to decompose it into smaller batches of work. We call these small batches microservices. Microservices limit or reduce the cost of change. They isolate uh, the impact of change. They make it easier for small teams to work on the code. They make it easier for small teams to move forward independent of other parts of the organization. The cost of communication in the organization goes down. Right? This is what we mean when we talk about Conway's Law. Conway's Law says that software is a uh, reflection of the communication patterns of the organization that builds it. So if you have different teams and they don't do a good job of talking to each other, then the software that depends upon them talking to each other will also be poor as a result of it. So if you make it so that they don't have to communicate too often or that it's easy for them to communicate, then you make it easier for software to be deployed and released and to change. So this is what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to decompose into smaller batches of work when we move to microservices. We gain agility. Now, when you move to this architecture, you run into two big problems, two big pains. I call them the hemorrhoids of cloud computing, the hemorrhoids of microservices. Do you know what a hemorrhoid is, my friends? A hemorrhoid is a real pain in the... <clears throat> the first hemorrhoid, the first pain that you're going to run into is how quickly, how quickly can you build a production-worthy service from zero to, you know, finish? How quickly can you build a service that is worthy of being in production, that should be allowed to go to production? And all of the things that are required when you do that. That list is very long. Most organizations that I have been to, not yours, of course. I know you're doing better, but other organizations that I've been to, you know, most organizations that I've been to, again, not yours, they have, they have the dreaded wiki page the dreaded wiki page on their internal wiki with 500 easy steps to production. The wiki page that lists all the things that they must do, like security and heartbeat detection and load balancing and infrastructure and operating system patches and observability and security and all these things that have nothing to do with the business differentiating functionality that they're trying to deliver. It has nothing to do with the code that you're trying to solve, the problem you're trying to solve in that code. It's the stuff that must be done for every single new service. If the cost of doing these things is expensive, if it's too much effort, then you won't do it. So we need to make it easy to do the right thing. That's the first one. And for this, I usually talk to people about something like Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is a, a cloud platform that's optimized for the continuous and safe uh, delivery of software into a production environment and for that management of that software, right? That's one option for the infrastructure. And then for the application itself, I talk to people about Spring Boot. Spring Boot is a framework. It's an opinionated approach to building applications in terms of the Java ecosystem. It gives you the ability to build applications that are production worthy. It supports things like security and observability out of the box, right? It also makes it super simple to build a REST API and do all that other stuff. But that's the first hemorrhoid, the first pain. The second hemorrhoid is once you have done this, once you have built a system composed of lots of small services, they're talking to each other over the network. They're distributed. This distribution creates complexity, and you must address that complexity. Otherwise, you'll have problems. You'll have the kinds of problems that you don't want, right? The problems implied by separating your services across network partitions. So you need to address that, com that, that complexity as well. So that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to talk today about... Whoa. Come on. Is that flickering for you as well? What's going on? Okay. 
I'll just assume that was a well-meaning glitch and it's going to be fine. Good. So we're going to build a new application today here at start.spring.io. This is my second favorite place on the internet, right? We're going to build a new application. We're not going to focus too much on the domain of the application. I just want to have something that we can use and reference as an example uh, for our adventure today, for our journey together. So we're going to build a new application here at start.spring.io, my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place on the internet, of course, is production. I love production. You should love production. You should, bring, you should go early and often, as frequently as possible. Bring the whole family. Bring the kids. It's the happiest place on earth. It is better than Disneyland. I love production and so should you. But if you're not already in production, then you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. So we're going to build a new service that's called the reservation service, right? Reservation hyphen service. And our reservation service is going to use Spring support for building web applications. So we're going to use Spring support... <coughs> For building REST APIs uh, out of repositories, we're going to use uh, uh, the Zipkin distributed tracing. We're going to use the, uh, um, what else do we want? We want uh, Eureka for service registration and discovery. We want the config client. Uh, we want uh, an embedded in-memory uh, SQL database. So I'm going to use H2, right? H2 is an in-memory embedded SQL database, uh, which makes it perfect for rapid prototyping. It allows me to build an application that talks to a, a SQL data source very quickly. But because it is in-memory and because it's embedded, it's going to lose all of its data. Every single time it restarts, it's going to lose all of the data that it has in its memory. It's going to lose all the data every single time. In this way, it's very similar to MongoDB. It just loses the data all the time for no reason at all. Right? Randomly losing your data. So we, we're going to use that, and we're going to use JPA, the Java Persistence API. Uh, I'm going to use this because I make bad life decisions, so JPA. Okay? Now, I'm going to hit Generate, and that'll give me a zip file, and I'm going to use that zip file to, uh, you know, I'm going to open that up in my IDE here. Oh, oh. Okay. CD downloads. Wow, this keyboard angle is a little strange. I wonder if I can... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move my laptop so that we can have this discussion faster. Okay. Good stuff. Look at that. Right on. Thank you. Okay. Still connected? Oh, that's so good. So much better. Thank you. Okay. They have a podium up here, and the podium is nice, but it's angled, so I don't want to spend my time typing against the angle. Right. So now we've got a new application, and we're going to open this up in our IDE. And again, it doesn't really all that much matter which IDE. We just want to have something with which to work. So we're going to open this up. See, we're going to unzip. Reservation service, go to the reservation service directory here. And uh, what I'm going to do is open this up. Here we go. Now I'm going to use any ID. It doesn't matter what you're using. I'm using IntelliJ. How many of you have used IntelliJ? Right on. Very good. Cool stuff. What about Eclipse? Eclipse. Okay, right on. What about NetBeans? NetBeans is awesome. What about NetBeans? Anybody here using NetBeans? Okay. What about Emacs? Are you here, sir? Is the Emacs guy here? Where, where is he? Every city and country and continent that I go to, doesn't matter where I am, I ask, who uses Emacs? And it's the same guy. <laughs> same object identity. I say, who uses Emacs? He says, I do. And then he leaves. <laughs> he goes to the airport to meet me at the next place. Okay. So... Here's my code. Can you all see that? What we're going to do is we're going to build an application. And to make short work, to make short work of generating entities and so on, I'm also going to bring in Lumbach, right? Lumbach is an annotation, a compile time annotation processor. So I'm going to build an, an, an entity called a reservation. We'll use at entity. This is a JP annotation right here, right? Entity. And we're going to give it a primary key, private long ID, at ID. And uh, we're going to say that this is going to have a generated value, right? So that's a basic JP uh, uh, field. Then we're going to create a field here called reservation name. And what I want to do is I want to have getters and setters and uh, no argument constructor and all that stuff. So these, whoops, 
These three annotations are Lumbach, right? And with that, I've got now a basic entity that I can store in the database. I'll say reservation repository extends JPA repository, right? And the repository is going to manage entities of type reservation whose primary keys of type long. And with that, I now have something that I can use to write some sample data. So we're going to save some data into the database. We're going to say that this is a spring bean that implements the command line runner interface. And the command line runner interface is a callback interface uh, that will, spring will invoke when the application starts up, right? So it's a good place to put any kind of initialization uh, logic that we need when using the application, right? So let me just add this here. Whoa. There's my constructor. Very good. And I just want to insert some records into the database. So we'll say stream.of, and we'll say, uh, well, my name is Josh, Annabelle, there's Mark, and uh, uh, Mary, Mary. There we go. There's four names, right? So now we're going to say, let's write the names to the database, passing in the name as a, as a constructor argument. And of course, I don't have this constructor, so I'll create a constructor that takes that string. And we'll say this dot reservation name equals name, et voila. Okay, so there's our there's a repository, and I just want to I want to confirm that everything's worked as expected. So I'm going to visit each record that comes back and just print out the results. Now this is <clears throat> already useful, I think, but you know I want to I want to have a REST API, so I'm going to use Spring Data REST. Spring Data REST is right here. It's on the class path. Uh, Spring Boot Starter Data REST. That's this bit right here. So I'm going to say to this repository that it is to be a REST API as well, right? So now if I run this code, like so, I'll take some water. OK. So that's up and running. And if we go to localhost 8080 forward slash reservations, I've got a REST API. The REST API has hypermedia, right? It's an implementation called it's an implementation of a pattern called hypermedia as the engine of application state. So hypermedia as the engine of application state. It's a, a way to support self-describing services. So I have the payloads, of course, but then I have information about the payloads here. These are things that, that, that tell the client what it can do with a, with a given payload. So this is the payload at reservations forward slash two. And then there's links, and these links are hypermedia. So you have the payload, and then you have links. This is called a resource. The whole thing is a resource, right? So this promotes self-describing services. This is very useful when you move to a distributed systems world where everything is an API. And remember, very few developers write documentation, and absolutely none, categorically zero, absolutely none read it. So we need to make it as easy as possible for developers to work with APIs without prolonging their pain, right? So self-describing services helps with this. Now, am I done? Can I go to production? Of course not, right? I've got a REST API. I can do put, post, get, delete. I can do all that kind of stuff. But right now, I don't know much about this application. If I run this code, what's going to happen? What if something goes wrong? It doesn't matter what company you talk to in Silicon Valley or anywhere else. When something goes wrong, the process to repair the problem is manual, human beings. It doesn't matter what technology they're using. It doesn't matter what their, you know, what their, uh, their application uh, behavior is, it, it is surprisingly consistent across all different organizations that the remediation process, when something goes wrong, is driven by human beings. So what we must do when we build an application that is production worthy is support observability. We need to make it as easy as possible for human beings to look at the system and look at the code and look at the applications and, and figure out what's happening. So this is not a new idea, right? Google talks about this in their Borg monitoring paper. They say that no matter what the nature of the service, no matter what they're doing in that service, they have HTTP endpoints that expose information about the service, you know, the memory, the heap, the things like this, things that they can use to understand the application. So this is supported in Spring Boot if we use the actuator, right? So I'll add the actuator here. Spring Boot Starter Actuator. OK, there's the actuator. And we, in order to make that work, we have to say management.security.enabled equals false. For our purposes, that's fine. And then we'll just restart, OK? Now, before I do that, I want to comment out some of the things I don't need just yet, OK? So we'll get rid of this. We'll get rid of those three things that depend upon other services that just aren't there right now. So. Okay. Good. Now, let's restart that application. And when we go here, I can make requests to the reservations endpoint. Come on, there we are. Reservations 3, right, 1, etc. Now I go to metrics, 
And metrics shows me the information about the application, the memory, the heap, the uptime, the classes loaded, etc. It shows me the environment. Uh, it shows me the health. It shows me all the things that in the application that could fail, right? So I have now information about what is happening, and this supports observability at the service level, the one service level. Now, I showed you just a second ago that I can change properties in Spring Boot. I can go to this file called application.properties, and I can change properties in that property file. I can say server.port equals 8010, for example. And that's certainly useful, but imagine if I wanted to change the port when I move the application from development to Q&A to staging, etc. I don't want to recompile the application each time. That's a bad idea. So instead, what I want to do is I want to keep the configuration outside of the application, right? So I can do this very easily. I can just say my maven minus D because YOLO, true, clean install, right? Skip tests, YOLO. And I can go to the target directory. And here I have a, a so-called fat jar, right? This jar has everything I need to run the application here, right? So minus JSS reservation jars, 31 megs. Now this jar uh, has everything that's needed to run the code. And I can run it to say, you know, Java minus jar, reservation service dot jar. That's certainly interesting. But what I really want to do is I want to override certain parts of it. So maybe I want to change the port equals 80, 80, 20, right? Let's start the application up on port 80, 20. Now that jar is very convenient. It's 30 megabytes. I can add this as an attachment in an email, and I can send it to my dear grandparents. They are very, very smart, but they don't know much about computers. They could run this code because they have applets. So if your operations team insists on using WebSphere and they can't figure out how to make this work, have them call my grandma. She is very nice. She has cookies. She will help them. Now, we have this application that's up and running, and you can see it's on port 8020, right? That's certainly useful. It's better than having the configuration in the jar code itself, but it's for, it doesn't help me in four situations. What if I want to centralize the, keep the configuration, keep it in one place? What if I want to reload the configuration while it's running? What if I want to have secure credentials, passwords, that kind of thing? And what if I want to see who changed the configuration and then roll that configuration change back? For this, I need something more sophisticated. I could store all of my directory in a configuration folder, you know, and I could use a version control system like Git or or Git, or maybe I could use Git. I mean, there's a lot of options here, really. You know, uh, Git is a choice that I think you should all make. Uh, that would certainly solve the centrality issue, and that would solve the um, the uh, uh, auditing and journaling requirement. But what about those other two? Live reconfiguration and uh, you know security. So for this, we need a server, something that sits between my configuration, my 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 directory of configuration, and my microservice. Right. So we're going to create a config service, a Spring Cloud config service. Okay. Now, this config server is just a microservice. It's an API that we're going to use to manage the behavior, or to, ac to manage access of the uh, uh, the configuration to the microservice. Okay. So here we go. I'll drink some water. Oh, go go go. Oh, that's so good. All right. Now, a couple things that we need to do. We say here, at enable config server, and then we have to say spring that uh, cloud that config that server that git that uri equals dollar sign home desktop config right, and then we need to tell it uh, on what port we want it to run so that other services can find it. So I'm going to use that port, and we'll just start the application. Okay, so there we go. We're going to start it up. And now other microservices, when they want to get their configuration, they will say, hello, my name is whatever, and then here's the configuration I need. So imagine that we are identifying ourselves as the reservation service. We would go to reservation service you know, on 8888, reservation service forward slash default, where that's the spring profile, and we'd see two properties, two files of properties, reservation hyphen service dot properties and application dot properties. Reservation service dot properties is visible to everybody, to only the microservice called the reservation service all the other microservices will see this configuration. So we see here two values that are interesting. Server.port is equal to 8,000, and we have a message, hello world, right? So let's change our reservation service here and have it talk to the config server. So we're going to now bring in the Spring Cloud Starter config client, right? We're going to bring that in, and we're going to just change this. We're going to say Spring application name equals reservation hyphen service. And optionally, you should also tell it where to find the config server, right? So you can say this, but I don't need to do this in this case because the, the value that I have given it, that's the default value. 
So that'll work. Uh, I'm only showing you because I care, right? But I may forget next time, and I just want you to keep that in the back of your head. This works because of the, con by the, of the default value here. Now, let's go to the code, and let's create an endpoint. Let's say class message rest controller, and I'll just say at rest controller, and I'll inject the string value here, right? At value, and the value is going to be something I'm going to inject in the constructor like this, message, and we'll create an endpoint that just shows the message. We're just going to parrot the message to the client, right? So public string message, and all we're going to do is return this value that we've injected. Now, I can imagine wanting to change this message, so I'm going to make this bean refresh scoped, right? And when I do that, I'll restart the application. Now, if everything works, then we should see this application on localhost 8000, forward slash reservations, there it is, and there's the message, right? That message is working, it's good, but I think we can do better, I think we should do better, right? So let's go here to the config directory, and I'm gonna use Emacs, you know why? Because I'm not a savage. So I'll use this, and I'll say that while hello world is certainly true, it's not great, right? Um, Luxembourg, right? Okay, uh, yes, get status. Get commit minus A minus M, YOLO, okay? Now, if I go to the config server, you can see it has updated the, the, the message, but here it has not changed. That's because we have to tell it to refresh its configuration. And so we can do this a few ways. We can say curl minus D HTTP local host. So I'm, then, I'm, I'm basically sending an empty post, right? I could actually just do this. I could say minus X post forward slash uh, refresh, right? So I'm triggering another actuator endpoint. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a request to the actuator endpoint, and then I'm, I'm gonna play a game, a game that I have never won, but I want to win, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make this request, and then I'm gonna hit enter, and then I'm gonna hit control, t or alt tab, then I'm gonna hit control R to refresh the browser as fast as I can. Okay, so. Ah, uh, do, twa, yeah, no, no, did I do it? Oh, wrong one. Ha, 8,000, <laughs> ready? One, two, three, go. No, son of a, it beat me, it was faster. It changed the configuration live, right? So the configuration's already visible there. And this is nice, I have now the ability to centralize my configuration. I can do feature flags, I can decouple the deployment of software from the release of software, right? This gives me a lot of benefits. Now this is one pattern that is very useful in a distributed system, but it's not the only one. The other thing that I care about in a distributed system is making it easy for one service to find another, right? The centralized configuration is nice because I have a server and the server can do security, I can centralize my configuration, I can do auditing and journaling, I just did live reloading, so that's very useful. But the next thing that I care about is making it easy for one service to find and work with another, and we could use DNS. DNS is an option, but it's not a great option because DNS can't answer all of the questions that we care about. It cannot tell us, for example, if that service that we're trying to call is there, right? It'll tell us where it is supposed to live, but it can't tell us if there's something there that will respond. So I want to be able to ask questions about the state of the system, and I want to be able to have more control over my load balancing uh, algorithm, my load balancing approach. So instead of using uh, DNS to find other services, we can use a service registry. And there's a lot of great options here for service registries. Spring Cloud supports an abstraction called the Discovery Client. And the Discovery Client makes it easy for you to talk to different service registries like uh, Apache Zookeeper, like HashiCorp Console, like Netflix Eureka, like um, etcd, and like Cloud Foundry, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say unzip uh, eureka-service. And I'm going to use Eureka. This is the Netflix Eureka project, right? And I'm going to use this because uh, of two reasons. First of all, it's super easy to set up and get working for a local demo, so it's very convenient. And the second reason is that, well, you know, uh, it's been used by one of the largest websites on the planet for years and years and years. So we know that it works well, so that's fine. So we're going to say spring application name equals Eureka hyphen service. And then we're going to go to the application code base here and say at enable. Eureka server, right? And then we're gonna run this code. That's our Eureka service. Now, again, the Eureka service and the config service, these are things that I care about, but I don't wanna have to write this code. This is undifferentiated heavy lifting. It's work that does not make 
my, my company, my organization, my team better. It doesn't help me. It just helps the operational aspects of my application. So it's much better to have a recipe for this and then reuse that recipe over and over and over. If you have a platform like Cloud Foundry, you can just say CF create service, Eureka service, right? You don't spend time operationalizing it and scaling it and all that stuff, right? So now we're going to say at enable discovery client. And the reason we're using the discovery client is because we want to talk to the service registry using the Eureka discovery client abstraction, right? So here's that. And let's restart the code. Oops. Now what this is going to do is it's going to start up and it's going to register itself in the registry, which is here. So you can see that the service is now available, and it's on this IP, this service ID, and this port. There's an API. I can now ask the service, where does that service live? And we can talk to that service. So let's do that. Let's create a client to talk to the service that we just, we just registered and advertised in the registry. And our client will use Spring's web support. It'll use the REST repository support. It'll use Lumbach. It'll use the Hystrix circuit breaker. It'll use the Zool microproxy, Fane for declarative clients, Actuator for operational concerns, maybe OAuth, Zipkin for distributed tracing, and... Uh, I think that's enough. What do you think? Is that enough for now? Okay. So I do, what I want to do now is I want to open up that client. And we're not just building any client. We're not just building a client just for the sake of building a client. Instead, what we're doing is we're going to build a client called an edge service. An edge service is a, a service that lives at the outside of your architecture. It lives uh, as the first port, you know, the first, uh, first place where requests come into the system. So let's get rid of uh, OAuth for now. We don't need that. Maybe we'll get rid of Zipkin for now. We don't need it yet. And uh, let's now configure the application. So reservation service or reservation client, we'll say at enable discovery client. We'll uh, point this to be reservation hyphen client, right? Very good. So that, that'll be our client. Now, what I want to do is I want to make it easy for actual clients, things like my iPhone and my PlayStation and my Roku, my Xboxes, all these different things. I want to make it easy for them to find this, uh, for, for them to talk to my downstream services, my reservation service, and all of my other microservices. But my, my clients are different. They have different technologies, different protocols, different payloads, etc. I can't change every single microservice every single time I want to add a new client. Think about HTML5. HTML5 browsers are very smart, but they live in a secure sandbox. I cannot make cross-origin requests to them unless I add an access control header. That's not very useful, right? I don't want to change all of my microservices just to allow a new client. So instead, we can create an HTML5 edge service or an Android edge service or an iOS edge service or whatever. You can handle client-specific concerns. Maybe instead of adding the access control headers, maybe I just want to proxy the requests. I want requests that go to my edge service to go through a proxy to talk to my services in the registry. And I can do that using Zool, right? Zool, of course, was named for the Ghostbusters movie. There's Zool, right? That's the guardian to the underworld, right? He protects the door to the underworld. So he's the proxy, if you will, to the underworld, right? So here's my edge service. And thanks to the Zool proxy, I can now go to, oops, reservation, reservation. Did we forget something here, friends? Oh, my goodness. Spring Cloud Starter Config. So I started, I started it, but it didn't have its configuration, so it didn't do what I wanted it to do. So we'll fix that. That's easy enough to fix. OK. There we are. So Zool is going to start up, and it's going to talk to the registry, which it sees right here. It's going to say, whenever a request comes in, it should proxy the request to the downstream service. What is going on? At enable discovery client. We have Eureka, right? Fane. It's not talking to Eureka either. Can you believe we did all that and we still didn't write, have the right dependencies? So we need more. More. OK. Good. So. Come on. So embarrassing. There we are. 
So there's our service, right? It's talking to the downstream service. You'll see that it's talking to the service at 9999 reservation service forward slash reservations. Uh, it's different URL, right? There's the actual service is here, localhost reservation names, or sorry, reservations uh, on port uh, 8000. That's the actual service. This is the edge service, actual edge, actual edge, right? The URL is different. So when the proxy sees the context path, it uses that ID to look up the service in the registry. It goes to the registry. It says, give me all of your service instances. It has a collection of them. It has to pick one, and then it reroutes the request to go to that particular instance, to that IP, to that par particular port. And then it rewrites the URL. The, the request from the proxy has, an, uh, has a header with the origin, right? So the downstream service can rewrite the URL to be locationally decoupled. It doesn't matter where the, re the response is being generated. The client doesn't know. The client thinks it came from the service that it's calling, right? So this is very useful. I can proxy all of my HTTP endpoints like this. Maybe I'm done, but sometimes I want to do more than that. Maybe I want to transform the data. Maybe I want to call the downstream service and compose the responses from different services and create a new service endpoint or enrich the existing data or do some sort of transformation or translation. Or maybe I want to add security. In this case, I'm not just uh, sending a proxy request. I'm actually creating an API adapter, right? So let's do that. Let's say reservation API adapter REST controller. Okay, and we're going to say at REST controller, and we're going to create an endpoint. Let's say that we have an endpoint that just returns a collection of names, right? Like this. So we want to return names, and we're going to map this endpoint here to forward slash reservations, and we'll create an endpoint get mapping forward slash names, right? There we are. There's our endpoint. And what we want to do is we want to we call the downstream service. So I could use Spring Framework's REST template, right? I could do that. But the REST template, by default, doesn't know about ribbon. It doesn't know about the client-side load balancing. It doesn't know about the uh, process that I just described to you where it talks to the registry. Uh, so I need to create a custom REST template and say that it should be load balanced, right? This will teach it to, to resolve URLs like this. If I say REST template dot get for entity HTTP reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations. This URL here is a service ID. That URL will be rewritten. The code will be processed. It'll go to the registry. It'll get an IP address. And it'll replace this with that. And then it'll make the call. So all the load balancing happens in the client. I could do this. That's certainly one option. But it's very low level. It's very low level. It's very HTTP centric, right? And I, it's a lot of code. If I duplicate this call across other places, I would have to duplicate the code. So it's common to create a client. But we don't want a client that has too much magic. We don't want too much business logic in the client code. So instead, we're going to use Fane. Fane makes it easy to, to declaratively uh, describe a client that talks to another service, right? So I'm going to describe a client here using an interface. So I say, at, uh, I say uh, Fane client. And again, I'm going to use another service ID. I'm not going to use DNS. I'm just using a service ID, and it's going to go to the registry, and it'll do load balancing and all that. And I'm going to say that I want the hypermediate resource envelope object to come back, and I want the payload to be a type of reservation, right? Now, of course, this class doesn't exist on my ID, does it? I don't have this type on my local class path. I'm going to do something that you should never do, though. You should never, ever do this, not even when you're all by yourself, all alone, at home, and no one is looking. I'm going to copy and paste code, OK? Don't do this at home, ever. So all I'm doing is I'm going to copy and paste code. I'm just going to create a little POJO, a little DTO. And there we are, right? So that's all I need for our purposes. We'll say at all our constructor, great. And now I can use this declarative client. I can inject this into my API adapter REST controller. I can say private final reservation reader reader add a constructor parameter, and I'll say return this.reader.read. And then what I want to do is I want to get the payload, get the reservation. I want to say um, get content, and then, oh, resources. That's what it is, OK? A collection of, of resources. So get the content, stream over it, map from reservation to reservation name, dot .collect, collectors, dot to list. Etc. Now, if I run this code, we have a new client. But what's going to happen? Right? This is going to be a load balancing client, and it's going to work just fine. Whoa, what happened here? Method read not. Oh, right. I need to annotate this. I need to tell it how to figure out what to call. So I'm going to say make an HTTP get call using this endpoint. 
Okay. Now, what's going to happen now? This client is going to make a, a request, and it's going to call the downstream service. And if I go to localhost 9999 reservation names, we have our endpoint. That works. That works if we have one or more instances. Right? But what happens if we have zero instances? Right? It's going to blow up, isn't it? We're going to make a call to the downstream service, and that downstream service doesn't exist. And so we're going to run into a problem, because it's going to try and load balance across the instances that it finds in the registry. But if there are zero instances, that's like, well, that's like dividing by zero, right? Do you know what happens if you divide by zero? What is zero divided by zero? Imagine that you have zero cookies and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And you are sad that you have no friends. It's true. Don't make Cookie Monster sad. Don't try and divide by zero. Prepare for the worst. Something will always go wrong. A cloud-native system is robust. It does the right thing in the face of service outages and topology changes. One way we can ensure robustness in this read is to use what's called a circuit breaker, powered by something like uh, Netflix's uh, Hystrix project, right? And I can say at circuit breaker, at Hystrix command, and I can give it a fallback method that will be called if there are enough exceptions or if there's an exception in the body of that method. In order to enable that, I just need to say at enable circuit breaker, okay? So now I'll restart the code, and that'll give us a Hystrix circuit breaker. So now if I go to this endpoint, it'll do the right thing, of course. It, you know, it's fine, just like before. But now if I go to the reservation service and kill it, it gives me the empty array list, right? It didn't give me an exception or a status code like 500 or anything. It just failed to the fallback method. High-performing websites do this kind of thing all the time. They'll say, oh, well, you went, to the, you, you went to a website, you went to the search engine service, it's not available right now, here are some machine learning recommendations, right? Machine learned recommendations. It's not what you wanted, but it's better than nothing. It, it's graceful degradation. So this is very useful, and if you have a cloud platform, uh, like Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry will restart your services. If they die, it'll start them back up again. You can sleep at night, not worrying about your services. The best thing about this is that we are giving the platform time to restart your services, time to uh, let your system come back to life, to heal itself, right? The last thing that we want to do is to overwhelm the service while it's trying to come back to life. We all know that if a website is slow, the best thing that you can do is to refresh the browser a lot, right? Of course not. The same is true for building a distributed system. We want to let it have time to come back to life. So let's go back to here, and we can see it's now healed again, right? Eventually it saw that the service registry is available and it let, let traffic go through. Now, this is a way to build a distributed system. We've, got, we've built robustness. We've looked at agility. We looked at observability uh, earlier on. We talked about a specific node, one node. But what about the system itself? Right? What about the whole microservice system, not just individual services, but the thing, the whole thing as a, as a, as a, as a, a total thing? We haven't really addressed that, have we? We can't see what's happening in the system itself because we've been focusing on individual services. What we want is a way to understand the behavior of the system, to see the behavior of the system. Remember, if I'm here in, in Luxembourg, is that the same thing? Is that the, uh, the same thing as looking at the Google map of Luxembourg? Tonight is the festival, right? The, the, la Fête Nationale, right? If tonight is the Fête Nationale, am I going to have the same experience being in the street here tonight? Will it be the same as if, as if I look at the Google map? Of course not, right? The, the experience here on the ground with the people in the culture, in the air, you know, all that is so much more interesting and more vivid and more beautiful than the Google map. The Google map is not the same as the terrain. It's not the same as your, your city. The same thing is true for your architecture diagram. Your architecture diagram is not the same thing as your production systems. And you cannot understand your production system unless you're there, unless you're monitoring your production system as a whole, capturing emergent behavior. We need to capture that emergent behavior. We, right now, we have a circuit breaker. That circuit breaker is very useful. It can be used as a proxy if I, even if I cannot monitor other people's services, I can monitor the circuit breaker. If something is wrong, the circuit breaker will say it's open and it won't let traffic go through because it sees that there's been an exception. That circuit breaker has state. We can use that state to say, okay, well, the service that we're calling, somebody else's API, it's down right now. 
I cannot put my monitoring infrastructure, my monitoring agent in their code, but I can monitor my circuit breaker, right? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to go and create a circuit breaker dashboard, Histrix dashboard. And we'll say Histrix dashboard, config client, Eureka discovery, and then we'll hit generate. And that gives us a new, uh, a new project here. Unzip Histrix dashboard. Okay, idea, pom.xml. All right, now. Histrix dashboard, at enable Histrix dashboard, at enable discovery client, spring application name equals Histrix hyphen dashboard. Okay. There we are. So that's going to start up and it's going to spin up in port 8010. So 8010, Histrix.html. There's our Histrix dashboard. And what it is expecting is a heartbeat stream. A stream that tells it the status of the circuit breaker. Bum, 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 bum. So we're going to take that circuit breaker stream from histrix.stream, right? You can see the stream here. Okay? And the stream, you know, the browser is kind of not great at this, but the stream is actually generating new data all the time. It goes on and on and on and on forever and ever and ever. And ever. As long as the sun is in the sky, as long as the oceans and the clouds, as endless as the bugs in your code, just infinite, infinite. So whatever you do, my friends, whatever you do, and I cannot underscore this enough, I cannot emphasize this enough, do not curl this endpoint. So I'm going to take that endpoint here, I'm going to paste it into the dashboard. I'm going to say monitor. And I'm going to move that over here. And I'll go to the stream. I'll go to the reservation names endpoint. And as I make requests on the left, you can see the moving average. It shows that there are 16 requests, 20 requests, 27 requests, 33, etc. It's showing me the flow of data through that circuit. If I kill the downstream service, this will say open, not closed. So this is one way to get the visibility into the flow of data uh, from one service to another. Another is to use distributed tracing. And we can do this very easily using Spring Cloud Sleuth, right? Sleuth, like this. Sleuth, in English, is like a detective, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, you're looking for clues. And we have an implementation of that called Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin. So I'm going to add this abstraction to my reservation client. Right, there's this. We'll go to the service as well. And we're going to bring that implementation as well from here. Good, so there's this. And now we'll go to the reservation service and we'll start it up as well. So, reservation service, reservation client. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to, these things are going to start up and they're going to uh, send information about the flow of data from one node to another. There's distributed tracing in theory is very simple. What we want to do is we want to intercept every single message that goes through the, the applications from every node to every other node. In theory, this is very simple, but in practice, it turns out to be very complicated because you have to handle all the different edge cases. You know, if you have the micro proxy, if you have uh, the REST endpoints, if you have uh, the uh, messaging code with Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ, uh, if you have anything that isn't, you know, already thought of, then you have to make sure that when the message arrives, you add a unique header, and then if you have a unique header, you want to make sure that you uh, perpetuate that header, right? So we want to do that here as well. And we're going to capture that information. Spring Cloud Sleuth does that for us. But I need to add one more thing. I forgot about this. Zipkin hyphen server. Okay. At enable Zipkin server. At enable discovery client. We're going to say spring application name equals Zipkin hyphen service. Okay. And we'll start this up. Now, that's running on port 9411, right? There's my Zipkin service. Let's generate some traffic here, one to the other. And as we do that, you can see that my Zipkin server sees both the service and the client. If I click on service, it says find trace, and it shows me the waterfall graph of the requests in the system. It says the request started the client and then went to the service. I click on this and it shows me the time, the in and out, and all of that. So I have information about the state of the application, its life, you know, its total emergent behavior. And I've done this a couple of different ways using the uh, Histrix dashboard as well as the 
the Zipkin distributed tracing. This supports online telemetry. What's happening right now, right? If you had to create a dashboard that showed me uh, the present status of the application, red, green, or uh, yellow, what information would you include? That information is what you get from these dashboards. They support online telemetry. This distributed tracing abstraction works with RabbitMQ and Apache Kafka and Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Integration and all the rest stuff and the Fane client and the rest template. All of that is automatically traced for you. And you can, of course, customize that. Now, we've looked today, my friends, at just a few things. Just a few things. I wish we had more time. Maybe then next time we could actually look at some more interesting stuff, right? Maybe we could look at uh, how to do um, messaging-based microservices using Spring Cloud Stream to talk to RabbitMQ and Apache Kafka. Maybe next time we could talk about si single sign-on and security using OAuth to protect your services using Spring Cloud Security. Maybe then we could talk about uh, secure configuration values using Spring Cloud Vault. Maybe then we could talk about stream processing using Spring Cloud Dataflow. Maybe then we could talk about consumer-driven contracts for integration testing with contracts using Spring Cloud Contract. If we had more time, we could talk about a lot of stuff. I, I hope you liked some of what you saw here. Did you like any of that? Just making sure. I just want to make sure. Now, I liked it. Of course I liked it. I'm wearing a Spring T-shirt. I have spring underwear. I mean, I, of course I liked it. But you don't have to take my word for it, right? There's a lot of companies that are using the Pivotal stack to do amazing things. In the West, well, further West, in, in the States, there's a company called Netflix. Netflix is using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at production scale. They've talked about it in, in articles and magazines and videos and talks and so on. There's another company uh, going further East, right? If you, go to, if you go to China, there's a small company there called Alibaba. How many of you have heard of Alibaba? They have the largest catalog in the world, more than a billion items in their catalog, and they're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud at production scale. There's another small company in China called Baidu. How many of you have heard of Baidu? They serve 600 million Chinese users a day, and they're using Cloud Foundry, Spring Boot, and Spring Cloud at production scale. How many of you have heard of Rakuten.com? It's an e-commerce engine in Japan. How many of you have heard of them? They're like the Alibaba of Japan. They're using Cloud Foundry, Spring Boot, and Spring Cloud at production scale. What about Yahoo Japan? How many of you have heard of Yahoo Japan? Yahoo is Yahoo, of course. They're using Cloud Foundry at scale, right? These companies have the need, the motivation, and the capability to solve these problems themselves, and they still use the Pivotal stack because for them, at the end of the day, the most important thing is getting to production and getting there safely and faster. And that is why they choose the Pivotal stack. Thank you, my friends, so much. Thank you very much for your time. Merci d'être venu. Je suis très heureux d'être ici. Oh.